for those of you that came earlier, you sadly, or you can't, how can you not be bored of me by now? But anyway, um, this evening, I know it's quite late, everybody wants to get to the party, so hopefully this will be quite interesting and uh, you might learn something. I hope so. I certainly did when I first saw people talking about this. So, quantum computers. Uh, oh yeah, introduce myself. I'm James. I work for ThoughtWorks. I have done for three and a half years, uh, which is great. They let me do things like researching quantum computers and I get paid for it, which is absolutely amazing. Um, there's a marketing slide about ThoughtWorks. If you're interested in ThoughtWorks, if you want to know more, just come and find me in the party afterwards. I'm happy to talk to anybody about what we do. And here's some books written by people from ThoughtWorks. You'll notice there's nothing about quantum computing yet. Uh, somebody in the company suggested I should start on that, but <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? A little bit about why I'm talking about quantum computing, a little about what it is, and then there's going to be some demos of quantum code, which I've created as I've gone along. So, uh, oh yeah, and... Um, where exactly is it? So a lot of people ask me, I gave this talk in Poland uh, last month or a couple of months ago and a lot of people said to me I didn't talk enough about the current state of the art, why people should be interested in quantum computing. So I've taken that on board and uh, hopefully that will answer some of those questions. So, why am I talking about quantum computing? What entitles me to talk about it? So I was in Vienna um, back in March of this year. I had no idea what quantum computing was and this chap, Alistair, Collinson, who's now a good friend of mine, gave a talk on quantum computing, which went completely over my head. Um, and I could see it was going over the head of a lot of people in the room. And after talking to Alistair, I thought, well, maybe I could uh, make it a bit more accessible, but we'll see how that goes. And here's me talking about Alistair in Vienna the day afterwards. You can see it's the same picture. And what happened was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with CFPs, you put a suggestion into a conference and they take it up. This is a conference in Poland and I had to do it at the last minute. There was some boring stuff about microservices which you can see was rejected and then they accepted the stuff about quantum computing which at the time I didn't know very much about which made me feel kind of like that. So I then did a lot of learning. Uh, my Chrome browser typically had about that many windows open for the next couple of months because I was still working on client sites at the time. I went to lots and lots of meetups. This was one at Microsoft in London, talking about some new technology that they're trying to get. This was in a conference in France, which was uh, interesting because uh, there were two of them talking and I had the translator talking in English in my ear, but I also speak French. So when he was talking, she was replying and I could hear what he'd said sort of badly translated in English. It was a bizarre experience. Uh, and then somebody at ThoughtWorks got wind of the fact that I was talking about quantum and they asked me to take charge and, and come up with a quantum strategy. Now, we still don't know what that means, but part of it is that I've done a lot of learning, I've gone around and we're now starting to teach quantum and we're trying to understand where to position our company and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and part of this, this was a great moment for us at ThoughtWorks. Back in October, um, some of these people on here, it's not a great picture on this screen, but uh, we had exclusive access to the IBM quantum computers to run a quantum hack day where we were solving a, a problem in, in organic chemistry. Well, I say solving, it's a known problem. We were, we were going through the steps of what one would do to solve such problems. And that was, that was a fantastic day. It was, uh, it was really quite special. Um, and then this takes us right up to date. This is last week in uh, Belgium. And I have to say, if, you want, if you're interested in quantum, if you have a watch of this video, um, this guy, I, I can't remember his name, his surname's Van Rien. Uh, he, his presentation is very different from mine, but it's, it's also a great presentation. Well, I say, well, that one's definitely a great presentation for, for beginners quantum stuff, so I thoroughly recommend that. So, moving on. So, what are quantum computers, why, why are they different from classical computers? So by the way, a classical computer in this context means what we've always understood a computer to mean. So uh, we now use people like me that work with quantum computers, we call them classical computers. So I hope everybody in the room is familiar with what a bit is, so I don't need to spend too much time on this. Computers store zeros and ones, or on, off, two, two binary, a binary value, that's all they do. This picture down there, uh, that's a flip-flop gate which is stores a value or doesn't store a value depending on the current running through it. Um, a classical computer has something called logic gates. 
It takes bits as its inputs and it outputs bits. So typically it might take one, two, or three bits and it outputs one, two, or three bits. Simple stuff. Um, one important point, because we come back to it later, is in a classical computer, we can assume this, this bullet point here, um, we can assume that classical logic gates don't lose any information. The information that goes in and comes out is not disturbed. It's, it's, there are no errors. I mean, there are a tiny fraction of errors, but to all intents and purposes, classical computers, you can put as many gates as you want in a row, and, and it'll work. And that's a very important point. So what do classical computers do? This up here, this is a classical OR gate. Um, anybody that's studied computer science would know all this. This big picture here is a representation of how a classical computer sums up a load of OR gates and a load of AND gates. And what that is, is actually 16-bit floating point arithmetic. So, uh, or floating point multiplication, I think. So, all the classical computer does is take a load of these simple gates and combine them together into more complex gates to get more complex behaviors. That is literally all it can do. And uh, as we all know, that multiplies and multiplies and becomes something very useful. So, how does a quantum computer work? So, the quantum version of a bit is called a qubit. So this is short for a quantum bit. There's a lot of text on here, but I wouldn't read it all. Um, just like a classical bit, if you measure the value of a quantum bit, you will always get either a zero or a one. So far, so simple. However, for all but some very trivial states, at any given point within the quantum computer, the qubits are probably holding both the value zero and the value one. What does that mean? It means some really interesting and hard to understand stuff, which we get to later, and hopefully I can make it as simple as possible. So as soon as you look at the value of a qubit, and this is a very important point, it no longer has a superposition. Sometimes, and I'll show you this, they have an equal chance of returning a zero or a one, but as soon as you observe it, it then has a 100% chance of, on a subsequent measurement of returning the same value again. So by observing it, all of that quantumness disappears. And that imposes some interesting limitations on, on what one can do with a quantum computer. The actual physical implementations of qubits are very interesting. I don't understand all of them. But each different company, IBM, Microsoft, uh, Google's building quantum computers, there are very different ways of, of actually representing a qubit. A qubit is usually a quantum system. It could be a photon of light. It could be an electron that is either spinning up or spinning down to represent the zero and the one. Uh, it could be there's a piece of hardware called a Josephson junction, which is to do with superconductivity. So there's lots and lots of different ways to, to represent qubits. Uh, that picture down there is from a Microsoft deck. They're working on something called a Majorana topological qubit, which they believe will give them the advantage in quantum computers, but that it remains to be seen. Uh, and there's a bit about Majorana. If you're interested in, in quantum and particle physics, by all means, take a look. When a qubit is being used by a program, you may have seen this picture before. This is the block sphere. Um, it's a good way of representing a single qubit. What we're looking at there is the arrow, which is represented by this Greek letter here. I can never remember which Greek letter that is. Um, that will always be somewhere on the surface of the sphere. This is, this is theoretical. And it gives you, it, whichever value it's closest to, the zero or the one, it's more likely to return that value when you measure it. But it's not holding either of those values, it's holding both of those values. So if you want um, a really good, uh, I don't have the scope in this talk to do it, but this, there's a talk down here. I hope you can see that, skillsmatter.com. You see it on the slides later. A man called Rob Linden explains exactly all the mathematics behind the block sphere, why, why, the, why the states can be represented on, on the surface of a sphere. Okay. I'm not going to say any more about that right now. Quantum logic gates. Now, there's kind of two sorts of quantum computer. I'm not going to talk about an adiabatic quantum computer. That's for another talk. When we take, uh, follow the an analogy from a classical computer to a quantum computer, we have quantum logic gates. And just like in a classical computer, they transform the state of the qubits. 
Now, that there, I'll show you that, that picture on the bottom right there, that's from the IBM Q experience, which I'll show you their web page shortly. Um, most of those gates, the, apart from the first three, they're quite simple. What they do is if you hold a picture of that, um, the, if I go back to it, the block sphere, the X gate essentially rotates around wherever the X axis is here. So the arrow rotates 180 degrees. So it operates like a not gate against the value of the qubit. Uh, the Y gate does the same around the Y axis. The Z gate does the same around the Z axis. So they're quite simple to understand, easy to get your head around transforms. Uh, the other gates, less so. And the, one of the most interesting ones, uh, which is used the most widely, and I won't go into what all of these do, partly because I'm not an expert at it yet, and I don't always understand fully what's going on. The H gate that you can see there, that's called the Hadamard gate. What the Hadamard gate does is, if we again go back to our block sphere here, if the arrow is pointing straight up so that 100% of the time you're going to get a zero if you measure this qubit, the Hadamard gate will rotate that halfway round so that it is exactly halfway between. And what that means is that that qubit will then be in the superposition state of zero and one. And when you measure it later, it will give 50% probability of returning either value. And we can see that in action when we go. And the power of quantum computers comes from the fact that you have a series of bits all together, a series of qubits all together that are all in various types of superposition. Now, depending on whether you believe certain scientists or certain other scientists, when you perform a computation on all those qubits, it actually performs the computation on all the possible values at the same time. And that's why it's a very powerful machine for doing a lot of things. So uh, the maths, have I got it on this slide? I don't think I have. Um, if you've got n bits in a classical computer, that can hold a single number which is up to um, n bits long. In a quantum computer, because you're holding a superposition of states and because effectively it's two complex numbers, but I won't go into the mass, you can have um, for n quantum bits, instead of having two to the n different states, it's a vector space of two to the n dimensions, which is obviously vastly, vastly more data. And that's, that's where the power comes from. One final thing to say about quantum logic gates. Apart from those first three, the U gates, all of those other gates just um, perform transforms of 90 degrees in one or other direction around the sphere. Uh, so there's a limited number of states they can come up to with. That's called the Clifford group. And there's a piece of mathematics that says that you can, uh, a classical computer can do everything that those gates can do uh, efficiently. So those gates are not, they're good for theoretically and teaching, but they're not great for stuff. In order to do really interesting stuff, you need to move that pointer a tiny bit, which is what those U gates are for, to move the pointer into slightly different places, interesting places. If you are interested in understanding a bit more about how qubits work, let's see if I can get my computer to work. Uh, there is an app by IBM, uh, which I'm trying to, here it is, here it is. It's a phone app, it's for, this is the Android version. I was shown this by a man at IBM on the Quantum Hack Day. Essentially, what this app does is it represents qubits slightly differently, but you can play with them and mutate the state and see how they interact together by moving around those things. So if you're interested in looking at it and seeing how they interact, I recommend this app. Now, this is the bit where I can't remember how to get the presentation going again, isn't it? Oh, no, wrong button, wrong button. Oh, no. I need that one, don't I? There you go. Okay. Oh, no, that didn't work. Hang on. Oh, excuse me. Take that off. There you go. This always happens every time. There. Thank you. Sorry about that. We've talked about the Clifford Group, so I'm not going to talk any more about that. So what does this all mean? So I think we've already mentioned most of this. Quantum circuits, that's, that's what we call a quantum program. They can hold exponentially more information than a classical computer with the same number of bits. Um, and 
when you, we have quantum computers that are big enough uh, and powerful enough and a few other conditions are met, it will be possible to solve problems using quantum computers that cannot, that are intractable with classical computers at the moment. And I've got an example of that later. Um, the downside of quantum computers, because by reading the state of the qubits, you squash that state down into one value or the other, what that means is you can't meaningfully persist state. So there's no notion of storing the state of a program and looking at it later, which also means there's no notion of debugging a program to understand what the intermediate values are. So that makes it quite difficult to reason with the program sometimes. Um, and the currently, the hardware, every time you put a qubit through a gate, it leaks information into the gate, the gate leaks information into it, and something called quantum decoherence happens, which I don't have time to explain. Um, which basically means that you have a limited number of gates that you can push your qubits through. So at the moment, um, the, size, the size of the useful problems that we can solve is limited by the, the physical hardware. It's limited by the fact that you can only go through a, a handful of gates, really. So that's why Microsoft have been talking about their Majorana topological qubits, because they believe that they will be much, much better at, at keeping the quantum coherence. So there are some downsides. Now I'm going to crack on and show a demonstration. Now, first of all, this is actually my daughter's cat, Clementine's cat. And you can see that the cat is showing its standard mood for cats, which is it doesn't care. It doesn't care about us. We're humans. Um, but I first did this, and I decided to run, because we talk about quantum superposition. We ran an experiment to see if the cat can have more than one mood. And what we found was it can have a superposition of many different moods. That's, that's by the by. What I'm going to show you now is some real quantum computers. So, uh, IBM has a real quantum computer, two real quantum computers that anybody can use. Uh, it is called the IBM Q Experience. You can sign up for this, um, get an account yourself, and, and run quantum circuits. Now, what you have to do uh, is, this is a quantum circuit. Is everybody in this room familiar with Schrodinger's cats? Heard of Schrodinger's cat? So it's the rather evil thought experiment um, which Erwin Schrodinger came up with, whereby you, uh, there's a radioactive decay, there's a cat in the box. If the, if the decay happens, a hammer breaks a glass vial of poison, the cat dies. And then when you look at the cat, it's either alive or dead. And this is an often used example. What we're doing here is we're, I'll explain the, the circuit. This H gate here, is that clear to everybody? So this qubit here is modeling the behavior of the radioactive decay. This Hadamard gate puts that qubit in the superposition of zero or one. So until we observe that state, it's both. This gate here is linking these two qubits. This is called a C not controlled not gate. This, the state of this qubit will be one if this qubit is one. And the state of, uh, and then from then on, they're entangled, which means that they will, they're forced to have the same value. Again, there's a quantum thing going on there. It's possible that two quantum entities that are separated in space, actually, they share the same state. And, and they're intrinsically linked. This is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. And he didn't believe in it. But I think most people now believe that Einstein was wrong. So this one measures the hammer, whether the hammer has moved or not. This qubit here, which is in turn linked to the hammer, measures whether the file of poison has broken. And then this qubit here measures whether the cat is dead. And you can see they're all linked to the same value, because we know that if the radioactive decay happens, the hammer breaks the file, the file gasses the cat, the cat dies. So this circuit is a very simple circuit that demonstrates the superposition of states here and quantum entanglement here, and then these pink ones are taking measurements. So I ran this. When you create a circuit, this is pretty much the simplest one you could ever want to create. You can then submit that circuit to um, the computer, the real quantum computers. If we just actually, before I do that, up here, this is telling us that right at this moment, uh, the computer called Tenerife is the one that's online. And this one, Yorktown, is in maintenance. Yeah. And I, every time I've ever come here, there's always one is in, is in use and one is in maintenance. Don't know why that is. And in fact, Dr. Wooten from IBM couldn't explain that to me either. So 
what does it do? Well, down here you can see I've saved a few simple quantum scores. So this is the Schrodinger's cat simulation, the same one we were looking up there. Now I could run it, but then we'd all be waiting here for an awful long time because to submit this to the IBM Q computer, you have to wait in a queue and ordinarily that takes hours or sometimes even days. So I'm not going to do that. But what I have done is, you can see here, I ran it three times on October the 12th to see what results we got. And if we look at this first one here, show the execution results. And I didn't want to show that one. I wanted to show this second one first. This one, you can see here, this one ran on a quantum simulator. And what we can see here is that we got what we would call a, a, a good result. So it ran it about a thousand times. 48% of the time, all the qubits were holding the value one, as you'd expect. So the first one, the radioactive decay happened, it knocked on the second one, they all have the same value, so unfortunately the cat died. In 52% of cases, nothing happened. The radioactive decay didn't happen, the cat stayed alive. So we know that this is what the result should look like, but this is now an illustration of the state of quantum computers now. Uh, how do I close that window? It doesn't have a close button. Oh, there it is. If we look at the top set of results, now this is, this is one where I actually waited in the queue for it to execute against a real quantum computer. And what we can see there is the cat stayed alive 37% of the time, and the cat died 29% of the time, and all these other intermediate states are errors. That's illustrating the fact that this was executed on a real quantum computer, and that kind of gives us the state of the art for that publicly available quantum computer now. The, the quantum entanglement isn't working entirely correctly. We don't know whether the c not gates have lost the information, whatever's happened there. But you can see that there's still quite a big set of errors going on in there. And so that's where the IBM Q, Q computer is now. So if you're interested, as I say, you can go up, set up a free account, you get 15 or 20 free credits, you can run your own experiments, and if you put circuits together, it's got a nice feature whereby um, if it happens to be logically equivalent to a circuit somebody else has done, it'll offer to give you the results that that, that other person got, so therefore, you know, you don't use up your credits to execute. So that's a good way of learning stuff. Now, how do I get back to the presentation? Oh God, not like that. Uh, I need to click on this one, don't I? Unmirror the displays, and then back to here. Wow, that was smooth, wasn't it? Okay, so that's the IBM Q experience. Next, Microsoft Code. Now, uh, I know this is a Java conference, so anybody that doesn't like Microsoft stuff, you know, you're welcome to stand up and leave now. <laughs> Um, but uh, I've looked for a Java compiler for quantum code. As far as I can tell, there isn't one. I was talking to some of the other presenters last night about writing one, but yeah, I've, I haven't got around to it yet. Um, all of my code, by the way, is available on my GitHub, so if you're interested, please feel free to go and download it. So I'm now going to show you some very simple quantum code, uh, which means, again, I have to do this. Okay, let's have a look at some Q-sharp code. Not that one, though. That one. This is the first program I wrote in uh, Q-sharp. I'm just going to comment that bit out for the time being, and I'll explain what's going on. What Microsoft has done for us is it's created a language called Q-sharp, which we can code directly quantum code in. This quantum code is, is perfectly good quantum code. It can be submitted against a real quantum computer if such a thing existed. So what you have to do at the moment is whatever you're doing in, in the IBM thing, you can write Python code and submit it. So effectively, you have a classical computer controlling what the quantum computer does. And Microsoft has given us this tool here. So what we've got is this file, driver.cs. Uh, again, I apologize for it being C-sharp code. But the, the driver file is, is what controls the quantum computer. So we have a very simple C-sharp program running here. What it's doing is, um, I'm just going to clear the junk out of the bottom there. Uh, as you can see, it instantiates something called a quantum simulator. And then later on, down on this line of code here, 
because that's obviously highlighted, it runs a cat mood experiment and it passes that simulator into it. And it also says, I want to do 100 measurements. And this is a very common pattern that we have with quantum algorithms. We say, right, run the thing 100 times and, and tell me all the different results that happened. Because at the moment, that's, we use the quantum uncertainty to our advantage to try and understand what the most likely outcome was. So if we now have a look at the Q-sharp code, what measure cat mood does uh, is a very simple simulation. The qubits there, there's four qubits. Each of those qubits represents a member of my family. One represents me, one my wife, one my daughter Clementine, and one my daughter Felicity. We then apply a Hadamard transform to each of the people. So what that means is we're now in a superposition of yes or no, zero or one. Each of us is in that superposition state. We've got an equal chance of doing something or not doing something, whatever that something is. So what, we sim what we're simulating here is the cat, the standard cat behavior is it asks me to feed her, and if I feed her, she eats the food, then she instantly forgets I fed her and goes and asks my wife to feed her. Again, if my wife feeds her, she instantly forgets she's been fed and asks Clementine, then Felicity, and so on. The cat is happy if she gets fed two or more times because that's the way cats roll. So what this um, program now does is, and I'll execute it. Hopefully, I didn't break the build. Let me just build it and check. What we're going to do is run that simulation 100 times to see how many times the cat is happy and how many times it's not happy. I did the maths using the binomial theorem earlier. So apparently, it should be happy about uh, ooh, 6 out of 15 times, whatever that is. 60%? Is that right? No, 67%. 66%. So if we run the program now, we'll just see a simple number saying, how many times the cat was happy. So it was happy 68 times, and it was sad 32 times. And here's what happens with quantum computers. If we run it again, we'll probably get a different result. So that's because of the uncertainty introduced by that, that Hadamard transform on, on, on all the qubits. So that every different time you get it, as soon as you measure it, you get a definite result. But as you can see, we're getting a different result each time. So often with these quantum computing experiments, We'll run something tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times to see what the results are that we get. And there's another very common use case with quantum computing, which I'm just modeling here again. In the case of this experiment that we're running here, we're going to check if the cat's happy using very similar logic, using Hadamard gates on, on each of the people. And then we're going to get that result out so that the cat says, I'm happy or I'm unhappy. Then we're going to push it the we're just going to basically run the same code again, but each time it's going to return control to the C-sharp program. So it's jumping in and out of the program, out of the quantum program. And what this models is a very common case where we're trying to optimize a function. We might have lots and lots of parameters to the function. We put it into the quantum algorithm to tell us how close to optimal that is. We get the result out, get some value out, and then we adjust all the parameters slightly, put it back in. And that's what we were doing on the quantum hack day. We were essentially trying to find an energy value function for for uh, uh, the state of an uh, organic molecule. So if we just run this one, what this one does is you can see it will write out a single line per outcome. So the cat will tell us whether it's, it's happy or not each time, and we'll see 100 results scrolling through. Um, can I run that without building it? We'll soon see. Because I know I just changed the cut. There you go. So half the time. So some of the time, the cat is happy. It's indifferent. And other, the other times, the cat is less happy. And that's, that's, that's a, a really simple illustration of running some classical code, seeing what happens in the quantum world, then running some more classical code, and backwards and forwards. Whew. How many people have I lost? <laughs> a few. <laughs> OK. All right. I'm, I'm here all day. I'll be in the bar afterwards. Right. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find this bit again. All this switching between the displays is really... Uh, right. Back to that. Oh, and there's some references to... These are different ways. One of these, which I haven't gone into because I don't really understand Python at all, is a Python kit that IBM has published, so it's based on the Python language. My colleague's really good at that. So. Why are we talking about quantum computing? Why do we care? 
What's it good for? Well, um, aside from a nice joke from Dilbert, still don't know if that works in languages that aren't English. I liked it. We've talked a bit about the IBM Q experience, and I happen to know from talking to an IBM consultant in London a couple of months ago, IBM are currently working with a lot of financial institutions on uh, using quantum computers to do predictive analysis of what's going to happen in the markets tomorrow. Their plan is that when they get to, when quantum computers are ready to do this stuff, they've already written all the software. And that's quite interesting. There's a few companies, there's at least one other company in London I know of that is doing that, that is consulting with big financial institutions on this. And there's a couple in Cambridge in the UK as well. Um, we've already spoken about the Microsoft Development Kit. Don't need to talk about that anymore. Um, but yeah, just to say on this, again, I apologize, it's a Java conference, but it's really simple to install, and it's got a lot of samples, which I haven't mentioned, so get that if you're interested in writing some code. Microsoft believe, and this was published back in March, uh, a man called Todd Holmdahl, I don't know if I've pronounced his name right, is head of Quantum at Microsoft. He said publicly back in March of this year that he believes Microsoft will have a usable public quantum computer stack within five years. Other people don't believe that, but that's what Microsoft is saying. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of a company called Regetti. They are a California-based startup, and they have just launched the first um, commercial cloud services, quantum cloud services. This was um, last month or the month before. So you can subscribe to that. I tried to subscribe and I'm on a waiting list, so I don't know how real that is. But interestingly, Rigetti, uh, just a few weeks ago, a uh, couple of months ago it says, announced a quantum advantage prize. Now what this is, they're offering a prize of a million US dollars to the first person or people or entity that can show a real world problem that is solved more efficiently by a quantum computer. So a real quantum computer solving a real world problem. I don't know how much of this is them trying to publicize their new service or how much you know, they ex ever expect to pay this out, but I know that there are a lot of people working on some of these problems right now. So what does it mean, what needs to happen for us to actually all be programming into quantum computers? Well, this is essentially the stack of stuff that needs to happen. I think that the toughest part is this bottom piece, scalable qubits. At the moment, such a thing doesn't exist. It's, it's too hard physically to build qubits. A lot of companies are working on it. So those three things, quantum classical interface, what I showed you on the program there, my C-sharp talking to my Q-sharp simulator, in the real life, in order to program the quantum computer, you need to not pass any heat to it because the heat causes quantum decoherence. So you have to find a way of making your classical computer talk to your quantum computer without there being any heat leakage. And the way that it's currently done in most cases is by firing a single photon of microwave energy at the qubit to change its state, to bump its state a little bit. So you can imagine that that technology is really, really hard to deal with. Uh, and then quantum error correction is, is a massive space. As I say, we saw that IBM slide earlier where there were lots of errors in it. People are working on ways of understanding what those errors are and correcting them. That's really difficult. Because heat co causes quantum decoherence, all those quantum computers, you've probably seen the picture. In fact, the picture, my blue picture on my title slide, is the, the heat, uh, the fridge on the IBM computer. You have to, we keep hearing from IBM that their computer is colder than outer space. Apparently, the fridge heats it to something like 0.03 Kelvin which is a couple of Kelvin below the temperature in outer space. Wow. So it's believed to be the coldest place in the universe. That's on the assumption that no other civilization is building quantum computers, but who knows? Um, these other two things, I think, are trivial. Integrating with a cloud provider. As soon as there's money there, Google will do it, AWS will do it, it and Microsoft will do it. And again, the top layer, the algorithms and applications, as I say, that is happening at the moment. I've seen consultants who are writing applications for the financial industry and for petrochemical companies and so on. So according to, this slide's a bit old now, uh, this, this I got from France, optimists say that we'll have real quantum computers to use for real world applications in 10 years, pessimists maybe in 30 years, 
And according to the chap on the right there, whose name is Gil Kalai, um, I read this paper and I didn't understand it, but he purports to have a mathematical proof that we will never have real quantum computers, but I, I don't know. So, uh, don't know why that hasn't moved on. There we go. So, what does the future hold? Well, this is D-Wave. This is a different type of quantum computer that I said I wouldn't talk about. They are currently using it to model traffic flow in the world. Modeling traffic flow is too complex a problem for classical computers. This is a representation from their website of, of them understanding the traffic flow in Beijing. That's less interesting than this, which is organic chemistry. This is a caffeine molecule. A caffeine molecule is the most complex organic module at, or in the order of the most complex molecule we can accurately simulate using a classical computer. This is something called iron molybdenum complex. I'm not an organic chemist, but that is a very important molecule because what it does is, does everybody remember crop rotation from school? You, you, you grow beans and then the next year you grow wheat in the same field because the beans take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into ammonia, which becomes fertilizer for the, uh, for the wheat. We know that the way that happens is um, by using this iron molybdenum complex, but it's too complex to understand what's going on. But quantum computers will give us the way to accurately model what's happening in that, find the ground state of that molecule, which potentially means that we won't need to synthesize ammonia once that problem is solved. That's a huge problem. At the moment, 3 to 5% of the world's natural gas goes into producing ammonia for the world's farms. So that's, that's the promise at the end of that rainbow with organic chemistry. Um, I've already spoken a bit about this. This was a talk I went to in London. The, uh, those two people were talking about their, how they are currently consulting with financial firms. Now, whatever you think of banks and so on, the interesting part about that is banks are now pouring big money into it. So it is coming. Harbour Bosch process, I just touched on this. The, um, as I say, 3 to 5% of the world's natural gas, it's a massive amount, goes into making fertiliser. If we understood that iron molybdenum complex, that perhaps wouldn't need to happen. I'm going to finish with Shaw's algorithm. Has everybody, anybody heard of Shaw's algorithm? Yeah, a few people. So, anybody know who these three people are? Wow. Ellis, Cox, and Williamson. Is that a yes or a no? Is that what you said? Yeah, okay. These two, these two probably got more famous names. They always come together, but I've got them flipped around in order. They're Martin Hellman and Whitfield Diffie. So these two published the first paper on uh, 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 public key encryption or symmetric key encryption. Anybody recognize these? You could probably know what acronym they stand for. These three are the RSA. So Rivest, Shamir, and Alderman. Now, this is the, the RSA algorithm is the one that most of our internet traffic, I'm told, is, is encrypted with today. So how does public key cryptography work? I'm sure you all know. You basically find something that's easy to do in one direction and hard to do in the other direction. So in the case of all those algorithms, it's to do with multiplying together two large prime numbers. And these are essentially the, the things we use. And you don't tell anybody the secret bit. <laughs> okay. And the point is this. If you want to factorize a large number, in a classical computer, it's essentially exponential time. It's sub-exponential time, which means slightly under-exponential. But according to what I've read, we currently use 2,048-bit keys for RSA, typically. Uh, it would take the biggest computers about 60 years to break those. But somebody's done a calculation based on the assumption that there is a, s a restricted number of atoms uh, and electrons in the universe, and if you made a theoretical classical computer using all the electrons in the whole universe, that computer would never be able to break 3,072-bit keys by using classical computation. So it's pretty secure, except Shaw's algorithm. Now, this is the workings of it. 
which I won't go through in detail now because I've actually got a worked example which I'm making available to everybody. It works on some quite cunning algebra. This, this is it. it. It looks fairly simple. Um, have a read of it. So where's the magic in that? Well, there's kind of two bits of magic. If we look at step six, I'm not sure how, how, much, how much time have I got left. Eh. Uh, you know what? I'm going to show the example of this. So this is the key here. We're finding the period of a smaller number. We're trying to factorize n and we're finding the period of a to the x mod n. Now what that means is if, if the number we're factorizing is 15, we pick a number smaller than 15, say 2. 2 squared is 4. 2 to the 3 is 8. 2 to the 4 is 16, which is 1 mod 15. And then the next number in the sequence is 4. So it has a period of 4. It repeats itself every four numbers. And that sequence will always repeat because there's only a finite number of numbers, mod n, obviously. There's only n numbers in it. Once you find that period of that function, you then move on to this step. You know x, if you don't follow the algebra, it's not that important. You end up with this relationship, which expands into this relationship here, which means that this number and this number are either factors of the big N or they're multiples of factor of the number you're trying to factorize. When I was working through this a few weeks ago, I, um, what I wanted to do was actually understand it myself, frankly. And what I did was I made a spreadsheet to show my workings out. I was trying to factorize this number, 1,517, using that algorithm. What I did was I tested four. You can see four, four squared, four cubed, and so on, and so on. And then when you scroll down this column, eventually it repeats there. So the period of four with respect to 1,517 is 90. Simple. So that, what that means is four to the power 45 minus one and four to the power 45 plus one will yield up the factors of, of our big number. And the reason why there's loads of other tests there is because I wanted one where the number was small enough so that it didn't overflow. So what I found was 14 has a, a period of 24, which means that 14 to the 12 minus 1, 14 to the 12 plus 1 will give us the factors which are 37 and 41. So far, so good. Where's the magic in all of that? So Shaw's algorithm. Oh, hang on do this every time, don't I? I forget to click on the... The genius of Shaw's algorithm ah. lies, and I am going to show you an implementation of it. We've already done this bit. I just explained that. Oh, and here's some numbers. So if you want to run through the mass, there you go. Uh, so there's the final answer. I'm sorry for those people sitting over there. I didn't realize there'd be a podium in the way. My clicker's gone a bit funny. I apologize. Now, here's the magic part. Step four. I've added this red text from the earlier bit. What I showed you earlier was basically in my spreadsheet, I was doing the maths each time. So you can understand that as that expands out, you saw the number we were doing was fairly small there. You could see how many times I had to raise the exponent to try and find a number satisfying um, stage five uh, and six. What Peter Shaw managed to do was show that using a quantum computer, you can effectively do something, the quantum period finding routine. Now, the interesting part about this is it uses this thing, quantum Fourier transform. This is definitely out of scope. But what the Fourier transform does, some of you may understand, may have seen the, the classical Fourier transform. It essentially transforms a function from the time domain into the frequency domain. So it's like putting it into a different dimension. Now, what you can do with the quantum Fourier transform using, so instead of actually looking at that, repeatedly squaring your number and squaring and squaring again until you find the period of it, what the quantum Fourier transform does is it twists it round to the frequency domain, so you can then find the period of the function, which is actually all you care about, if you think back to that the algorithm we had. So if you find the period of the function, uh, you don't actually need to know the values of the numbers until you find an appropriate number. So 
Peter Shaw's algorithm runs in polynomial time. So what that means is, as soon as we have quantum computers big enough to implement Peter Shaw's algorithm, RSA ciphers are no good. Any cipher that relies on, the, uh, on factorizing a large number is very vulnerable to quantum computers. Uh, I don't have a massive amount of time left, but I'm going to show you very quickly. Again, this is on GitHub. Um, oh, no, that's it. So what I've got here is a classical and a um, quantum implementation of uh, Peter Shaw's algorithm. So in this program here, I'm going to factorize. I won't go through the code. If you're interested, you're welcome to go and get it. It's pretty boring to look at to run, but I found it quite interesting to write it all. This is going to factorize 15. And as you can see, what we've got in the output, it chose 8. 8 squared is 16, so the period of 16 is 2. So it then said 8. My and what, what did we get? We got 3 and 5 out. So the period of, there you go. That was by taking, oh, sorry, the period of 8 is 4. So 8 squared is 64. So 64 minus 1 is 63. Mod 15 is 3. There's your first factor. 65 mod 15 is 5. There's your second factor. So that's how Shaw's algorithm works. This implementation here, if you leave this as false, it will just use the, the classical computation, which in this case is a lot quicker to the extent that I can, if what I did earlier is true, I can use this to factorize that big number. Let's see what happens. This is the bit where things blow up. No, there you go. So we found out that the factors of that big number are those, 139 and 137. Now, this is the bit where it's going to go wrong. Now, I have to pull out a disclaimer at this point. The largest number that is known to have been factorized using a genuine quantum computer and using a, a real implementation of Shor's algorithm is 15. So it's not that powerful at the moment. But what I can do is demonstrate. And when I was trying this earlier, it was just demonstrating to me exactly how unreliable the, even the quantum simulator currently is. Because one of three things is going to happen here. It's either just going to blow up with an exception or it will give us the right result, or it will give us some utter rubbish. But let's see what happens. So we're going to use, I've changed that to true, and I've left it at 15. So we're going to try and factorize 15 using the real quantum algorithm. Yeah, like I said, it could. Oh, what have we got? So it's now trying to find the period of 13. It's doing 13 squared, 13 cubed, until that repeats in mod 15. And if this is anything like earlier on, Oh, there you go, it got an exception. <laughs> I'll try it one more time. Because, it, honest, it did work once earlier. Let's try it one more time. And then I'll briefly show you the what. So this time it chose 11, so it's going to get 11 squared, which is 121, and so on and so on, until it gets back to 11. We'll see if it works or not. I've got about five minutes left. Ah, Okay, so if you're interested, again, that's on my GitHub. I think I showed the link on the previous slide. I'm going to show you very, very quickly uh, some of my codes, just so you get an idea for it. I've got this class called Factorizer. Again, it's C Sharp. I apologize to everybody. Essentially, it basically is applying, this is applying Shaw's algorithm in full. There are a full set of tests in here. I did it TDD. Um, and basically, based on this parameter up here, use quantum period finder, it either uses just a numeric method to find the period, or, oh no, sorry, it's buried within that, that find period function, which is in this helper class in here. So this basically has a, a quantum version and a classical version. The quantum version I, I took out of the Microsoft uh, samples and, and played around with a bit. Because what I 
what I'm trying to do is illustrate that that bit, Shaw's algorithm, only step four needs to be executed on a quantum computer. So as far as I'm concerned, you do all the other stuff on a classical and pass it to the quantum computer. So I hope everybody followed that. That's the first time I've tried to do that uh, little demonstration. Happy to talk about it afterwards. So that's an implementation of Shaw's algorithm. There are other algorithms already in existence. There's one called Grover's algorithm, which also has quantum magic in it, which is uh, used for finding things in collections. So, oh yeah, I forgot I put this in. This is me proving it actually did work earlier on. <laughs> oh, I managed to factorize 21 using my quantum code there. So I did a screen capture just to, just to show that it sometimes works. So, um, is RSA dead? Well, implementing Shaw's algorithm requires twice the number of qubits as the size of the key. And at the moment, the biggest known quantum computers have 72 qubits. So, yeah, it's a long way off. However, what do I do if RSA is dead? Yeah, here's an interesting point. Um, there was a demonstration in 1989 of quantum cryptography. Uh, it's explained in one of the books that is on my last slide. It's really interesting, but it's not practical. It involves sending single photons with the message encoded in them. I, I can't see that ever being a real thing. Uh, but there are already in existence classical computing algorithms that are not vulnerable to the type of attack that we've just talked about. Uh, they are, to wit, lattice-based, super singular elliptic curve, and symmetric key quantum resistance. So these things exist. We should start using them now. So, and there is a, a project called OQS, which is currently trying to get people to adopt post-quantum cryptography, i.e. These, these quantum safe methods. Now, I'm gonna return on in a moment. This is from 2015, the amount of money being invested in countries on quantum computing. It comes to one and a half billion, I think this is in euros. This does not include any government spending. And it does not include China, or Russia, or the USA. Is China there? Oh, Russia is there. But it doesn't include any government spending. This is known declared private money. So why did I mention right at the start? Diffie and Hellman published their paper in 1976. 1977 was when RSA was published. These are the first known algorithms. However, you remember the first three men that I showed you down there? Who are they? Why are they on this slide? Well, in 1997, it emerged that James Ellis, Clifford Cox, and Malcolm Williamson had created public key cryptography using algorithms that were almost identical to Diffie-Hellman and RSA. They worked for the British government. The British government never told anybody about this. So what concerns me is, is that happening in the quantum field now? And I'll tell you what is definitely happening because I've been told this explicitly. Every government that cares about this type of thing at the moment is harvesting all of your RSA traffic and is keeping it for the day that they will be able to break those RSA keys. So for me, that should be enough to tell us that perhaps after all, we ought to be slightly concerned about Shaw's algorithm. There's some books. Um, those are the generally the books I've read in the last six months about quantum computing. Have fun. They're, they're all very informative. And uh, thank you very much for listening.